Welcome to Vineyard Hopkinton. As we follow Jesus together, we experience the Holy Spirit, create a multicultural community, and pursue kingdom of God justice. Today I want to look at the, the wedding in, in Cana, uh, and I've uh, titled this message, you know, Surprised, More Jesus, More Joy. Uh, I, I mean, it's, everything about this uh, story is actually uh, interesting to me and uh, a surprise it's sort of not what you'd expect it to be uh, from all sorts of uh, different ways. I mean, the biggest surprise, I, I would say, is do we think of Jesus a- as being joyful? Or do you even have any pictures in your mind's eye of Jesus laughing and joking around with the, his disciples? Or are the only sort of images that we have of Jesus serious? Uh, because... <laughs> Uh, you know, I can understand why many of our images of Jesus are serious. And as uh, Liz and I do missions work in Spain, it's like there's this huge focus on the cross of Christ. And everything is um, uh, very, like, serious and sad. And the cross of Christ is, is absolutely vital. Uh, but there's almost no art or depiction or anything symbolic in churches, of anything that would depict joy or resurrection or Jesus laughing or, uh, you know, the resurrection side of Jesus' ministry. So, yes, the, cr- the cross is crucial, but the resurrection is also crucial. And uh, for us to, you know, sometimes a church just uh, laugh and enjoy uh, the other side of our life with the Lord uh, can be a little bit of a surprising thing because, yes, we take uh, our walk with Jesus serious, and yes, this is, you know, uh, a serious business. I mean, how you live your life and what happens in your life and what's going to happen when you die, these are all serious and important topics. But through all of that, Jesus is saying our life as believers, as followers, Uh, should be a life of joy, and joy has many levels. One is a joy of just, like, I always feel the sense that God is with me, and and no matter how difficult things are, it's going to work out. There's that kind of a joy. And there's also the type of joy where you actually laugh, you know, where there's fun, and there's uh, parts of our walk with the Lord which are just really joyous. And so, uh, with that in mind, I would, you know, like to press in a little bit about the story of Cana. I mean, yeah, there's just so much that we can, uh, we can talk about that and um, so many different ways we can look at that. But joys or surprised by joy or how has this been in your life a surprise of how Jesus has worked in your life, and it's been a real joy. I mean, I think one of the biggest surprises to me when I became a believer were my friends and the change in my friends. Meaning, um, you know, when I was in high school, I, I know this sounds really hard to imagine, but I actually can't recall anybody that was a Christian. I, I, I don't know if I was just hanging out with a really bad crowd, but I did not grow up in a religious setting. Uh, we had religion all, I mean, we'd start every day at school with the Lord's Prayer. Uh, but I didn't know anybody who went to church. Uh, I'm sure they were. I just can't remember them. And then afterwards, you know, when I was in the military, I, again, I, I, I didn't really know people that were committed. I knew people that were Jewish. I knew people that were Catholic. I knew people that were Protestant. But they didn't actually go to synagogue or to church. And so I, I just... My picture of what a Christian would be would, as a person would be somebody that was pretty boring. I mean, it was like, I don't know. I don't know any that are fun, but I don't know that it would be fun to be with a Christian. And then this crazy thing happens. You know, I come to know the Lord, and my friends start, like, changing. Uh, it, it, I've shared my story many times where I, I received the Lord, and very quickly thereafter, we got, Liz and I got married. And my best man at my wedding... Uh, he was my best man for a good reason. We were the best of friends for many, many years. 
but I'd become a believer and he hadn't. And he was pursuing his life in the way, I guess, we were pursuing life before that. And so at our, uh, at our uh, wedding, he makes a speech and his speech is like just totally off color. I mean, it was like really bad. And uh, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm listening to him thinking, well, I understand him, and I understand why he's saying what he's saying, but actually it's not funny to me anymore. I mean, before I probably would have been laughing my head off, but now I'm, now, I'm like, it was not funny. And so uh, he was a great communicator, and uh, he was going into law, and he, he's done really well that. But I remember Liz standing up, and she's also a great communicator, and she had a whole lot to say about, it, <laughs> about you know, rebuttaling, a rebuttal to his, his speech, and it was kind of, it was kind of funny. And I, but... As time went on, I noticed that all my friends became believers, and now I'm sitting in the situation where it's like, yeah, I, I really love folks that love the Lord, and I love you guys, and I love hanging out with you guys, and now my challenge is the other way around. It's like, how do I have meaningful, deep friendships with people that absolutely do not know the Lord? Because I think it's really important that I do have those friendships. But the point I'm trying to make is this. What a surprise, and what a joy when you know the Lord and you start seeing the incredible richness of friendships and relationships of people that also follow the Lord and people that are totally different from you, have different interests, different age groups, you know, uh, different careers, uh, different sporting interests, but you have this bonding and it's a total surprise and it's a really sincere love that you have for other people. So, yeah, I, I think seeing this joy that Jesus gives us and the surprise that it is that life as a believer in Jesus is an adventure, it's exciting, uh, God is in control, God knows each one of us personally, He knows what will be life-giving for us, and it's a surprise when we have this joy and this reward and this sense of satisfaction as we pursue life in Jesus. So let me, just, uh, let me just pray here. Jesus, just allow me to preach your good news and preach it in the power of your Spirit. Uh, amen. Uh, if you've got a Bible, why don't you open to, uh, up to John chapter 2, uh, the wedding in Cana. And I want to just read and talk about this section. The next day, there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. So this is kind of interesting. Uh, if you were at um, a church uh, last week, uh, you would have had a really, really good sermon, and I hope you, you didn't miss it. And one of the points that Stephen was making as he was preaching is how surprising the break makeup of the disciples were. And uh, what's surprising about this story is there's a wedding, and guess what? Jesus' mother's there, Jesus' there, and all Jesus' disciples are there. I mean, you know, uh, yeah, it's really interesting to me because they all hung out together, and they didn't like want to miss out on anything. So, you know, I just, for instance, love coming to church. I hate missing church. But with Jesus and his disciples, they always hung out together. And if you missed out on something, like say one of the disciples said, you know, I'm not really into weddings. And like, I don't know who this person is that's really getting married anyway. And, uh, you know, I'm really, really busy. And, uh, you know, I've got other things to do. And, you know, another service, I mean, a wedding, you know, they go on and on and on and, and, but that kind of wasn't their mindset. The mindset was, hey, we're disciples. We're all going to hang out together. We're going to be with Jesus. Now, if you happen to have been a disciple then and said, no, I'm busy. I've got better things to do with my day. Guess what you would have missed out on? The most incredible miracle of all time. Jesus' first miracle. Imagine you hearing that secondhand. You're like, oh, I was too busy. I was down with my boat fishing. Did you know that Jesus turned water into wine? Oh, yeah, right, right, right. No, I don't. No. Oh, I wish I was there. I wish I could have had some wine. I mean, like, really, can I taste that? I mean, you would have missed out on something incredible, right? And similarly, 
with church. You never know which church service is going to be the one that the Holy Spirit shows up, does something significant in your life. You can't sort of program it and say, God, listen, in fact, if you want to make God laugh, if you really want to make God laugh, say to God, this is how I think you should be making me into a disciple. I think, Jesus, I should uh, choose a church that really the sermon is really, really short because I don't want to be bored. And they, you know, the worship must play just the right songs that I, I want them to play. And uh, you know, I'll show up to church like once a month or whenever, and I really want you to change my life for the better. I mean, Jesus just standing here just laughing. He's like, oh, really? Now, let me tell you how I'm going to disciple you. Uh, not that bad. I mean, it's just a whole different way. Jesus has a whole different way of doing things. Uh, and I think Jesus would laugh at some of the things that we, we, we would say is important, you know. Yeah, I really like church, but, you know, it's 9 o'clock. It's just so early, you know. And then the 11 o'clock service, that's say, you know, 11 o'clock, you know, just too late. I mean, 10 o'clock. <laughs> it's like, really? Okay, well, whatever. Anyway, so the point I'm trying to make, all the disciples were invited uh, to the celebration and they show up. The wine supply ran out during the festivities. So Jesus' mother told him, they have no more wine. And then Jesus makes a statement which is really interesting. I mean, it's like, it's like one of those statements like, there's got to be more to the story that's not written here. Like, can we get some more background? And we don't. And Jesus says, dear woman, that's not our problem. Jesus replied, my time has not yet come. But his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now, <laughs> there's obviously, that's a strange response. Dear woman, he doesn't say mom, you know, like, what am I supposed to do? Uh, and then there's something else going on where Jesus' mother realized that Jesus could do something. And of course, now we're thinking like, what is Mary thinking that Jesus could do? Is Mary thinking like, Jesus, run down to the store and buy some wine or like help the guys out or pull out your wallet and pay for some, you know, I mean, this is going to be embarrassing. You don't run out of wine at a wedding. Uh, Jesus, do something. Or was Mary like thinking like, Jesus, you could do a miracle. You could, you could solve this problem. I mean, I don't know what was happening between the scenes, right? And then uh, Jesus responds and says, my time has not yet come. <laughs> it's like, wait a bit. What is Mary's request and Jesus' response? It's like a disconnect. But clearly, Jesus' life from the moment he was born until he died had purpose. He was very intentional about what he came to do and what he was going to do and how he was going to do it. But at the same time, when you read this story, there's like a surprise. It's like, okay, this wasn't part of Jesus' plan, so it would seem. And yet, clearly what unfolds is Jesus seizes the moment and says, okay, this is when I'm going to make my big announcement by doing an incredible miracle. Uh, Jesus seems to use the moment. So yeah, there's a lot, uh, there's a lot going on there, and it, it is kind of interesting. Standing nearby were six stone jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Okay, so, I mean, it's like that big. I mean, a large, <laughs> a large uh, a jar or vessel. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. When the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. <laughs> okay, this is also just like super funny to me and fascinating. It's like, okay, if you were one of those servants, how awkward is this moment? You know what you've just done. You've filled the thing up with water, and now you're going to take the water to like the heavy hitter, the, like the main table. And you know that this is going to be, like, embarrassing. So as a servant, you're kind of caught in between. It's like, okay, you have to obey, but you know that this is not going to go well. You're going to obey, and you're going to get chewed out or, like, whatever. But the interesting thing is the servants obey Jesus. I mean, that's a surprise. I mean, they just obey this other guy. He's not running the show. They obey him, which 
should tell us a little bit about our own walk with the Lord. We should just obey Jesus, even if the instructions Jesus are giving us is a little bit like convoluted or we don't understand the end result. Just obey. I mean, that's, we could be like the servants. But then the servants go up, you know, to the main table. Now, I was not born in America. Now, for any of you that were born in Europe, I've got to tell you that this is a little interesting to, you, to me. Now, you can shoot me down. I know. But if this was an American banquet and the servant came up with a glass of water, you'd say, that's so great. Your only complaint would be, where's the ice? Like, just fill that whole glass up with ice. But everybody from, like, Europe or everyone is like, water? Give me some, like, wine or give me a beer. But no, I'm having a meal. I don't want water. Now, I understand the Americans, you love water, and you love your water with ice. Okay, so even yet, they're not, like, complaining about the water and not having ice. But, you know, in their culture, I don't think coming up with a glass of water was, like, such a winsome idea. They were expecting wine. And lo and behold, as you know, that's exactly what they got. They got wine. When the massive ceremonies tasted the water, there was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though of course the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. The host always serves the best wine first, he said. Then when everybody had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine but you have kept the best until now. You know, so here's the, here's the other thing which I do find kind of interesting. Uh, it goes sort of against the grain of church. Jesus' first miracle is making alcohol. I mean, that just that is not right. That's not the way it should be. <laughs> but Jesus turns water into wine. The thing that we don't see in this story, which I would love to know, is like, okay, what does Jesus do when the servants are taking the water up to the main guest table? Is Jesus calling all his disciples over and saying, hey, guys, listen, you've got to watch this. Just check this out. All right? And then the guest like, sips and it's like, oh, just delicious. Is Jesus just like sitting there, just like killing himself laughing? He's like, oh, this is the funniest thing ever. Look at that. He's absolutely loving that wine. It's just incredible. I mean, we don't know that side of the story. But I can't imagine that Jesus sitting at the table like stiff face and just like, mm, you know, just drink that wine and be finished with it. No, he's obviously enjoying it. He's like, this is a great party. Now the party can really happen. They're enjoying the wine. The disciples must be enjoying the, the whole event and looking at Jesus and looking at the, at the head table and then looking back at Jesus and looking at the servants and then looking at the drums. And it's like, what just happened? This is an incredible thing. And can you imagine the joy when they left that ceremony and think, can you believe what just happened there? And everybody just, you know, had a great few glasses of wine and, and enjoyed themselves. This miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time G Jesus revealed his glory. And his disciples believed in him. Yeah, no kidding. Now all of a sudden, for the first time, they've heard a lot about Jesus and Jesus' teaching and Jesus saying this and that. But they'd never experienced a miracle, or they'd never experienced God's power. And I don't know how it is for you, or for, but, you know, when I've seen Jesus do miracles, it's faith-building. It's exciting. It's like, I want more of that. And, uh, yeah, I, it builds your faith, just like it says here. These disciples believed in Him. Now, notice this. After the wedding, He went to Capernaum for a few days with His mother, His brothers, and guess who else? Who else? The disciples. They all hang out together. I mean, this togetherness is really, again, for us, I think, a little bit of a surprise. Okay, so what can we learn about how Jesus is trying to make us into his disciples from this story? Uh, you know, he has five things which I'm extracting out of this story uh, for us. As a disciple of Jesus, life is going to be full of good surprises. As a disciple of Jesus, 
Life is going to be full of good surprises. There's joy. And there's an expectation that it's going to work out well with Jesus. There's a joy in that. And for many, I think if you speak to friends that are not believers, this would be like, what? Joy with Jesus? It would be unusual. Uh, to think of Jesus as a party guy or somebody that's like joking around or as somebody that's got a sense of humor, I mean, I think this is a challenge for us because we don't see a lot of that kind of imagery. But Jesus was super human as well as being super divine. But the humanness, the joy, the fun, the hanging out together, I think is something it's worth meditating on. And when we experience uh, times with the Lord that are precious or joyful, we should savor those. Uh, you know, we should have serious fun. I mean, that's, that's what it is. If we read this uh, verse in 1 Peter 1 through 8, it says this, Though you do not see him, Jesus, uh, though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. You know, so Peter's saying to us, look, there's something serious about this, and there's a, a serious, inexpressible joy. There's a sense of my life has purpose. I'm connected to the Lord. Uh, the end is going to go well. And no matter how many struggles and difficulties I have to go through, and I, you will go through, there's a sense of comfort and joy being Jesus' disciple. You know, we see this, uh, I think, in another way. Uh, after the resurrection, when Jesus reveals himself to the disciples, and at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is just poured out, and in a sense, the folks are responding like they're drunk. I mean, they're experiencing the joy of the Holy Spirit. They're experiencing uh, something miraculous where they're now talking in other languages. And there's something where, when we reflect on that, it's like, yeah, that's, that's part of our Christian life, where we can experience God doing something supernatural that's also purposeful, that's also intentional, but He uses you and I to do it. And when we can participate in what Jesus is doing, it's super fun, and it's surprising, and it's rewarding. And life becomes a joy when we track more and more with what Jesus is doing in our lives. The second point that I think I want to make out of this story is the motive of everything that Jesus does is love. And our motive should be one of love. I mean, it was out of love and out of care and concern at the wedding that he didn't want the host to be embarrassed. He cared about the people. And Jesus does things that are loving. And he's exhorting us to love one another and to have patience with each other. And love should be the underlying virtue in everything that we do. We should be motivated because we've experienced Jesus' love and there's a desire in us to just want to love others. That should be the first thing. Uh, you know, yeah, love is just not self-serving. It's helping others. The other th third point that I want to make is one I've already made, but I'm just going to reiterate it, and that is doing things together. Uh, <laughs> this constantly becomes a surprise to us because we're an individualistic society and we're in the middle of COVID and uh, we're very separated and isolated and understandably. Uh, in some ways. But ministry and life with Jesus means you'll be doing it together. And you'll be doing it together with people that are like-minded in their desire for Jesus. You're not like-minded in your career or your which football team you want to have win Super Bowl or, you know, th those things are, are secondary. You can be like-minded in other things. But there's, uh, uh, you do it together with people that are pretty unusual, uh, people that you probably wouldn't normally and ordinarily pick. And that's why life groups, which are just kicking off, are so awesome because you join a bunch of people that, you know, honestly, it's going to be 
testing for you. Some of them you're going to say, this is so great, I relate to them. But there's always one person in the group. It's like, you know, that guy like, just annoys me. And that's like, great, because God wants to shape you. He wants to grow you. He's going to put that person there specifically so that you, you'll develop a little bit of character and a little bit of patience and love his other. Yeah, I mean, that's part of life. I mean, and it's great. And, but overall, you'll say life groups are wonderful. I'm so glad I'm part of it. Uh, the, the fourth point I want to make is we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. Uh, we have the ability to say things and do things that change people's lives. We have the ability to say things where God just puts power on it. I, especially if we saying something that's biblical. Uh, God allows us to say things that will change people's lives. God allows us to do things, acts of service, or pray for people to be healed, or whatever, that will change people's lives. And the last point I want to say is this, being holy and being relevant. You know, the point that obviously needs to be made here is Jesus and his disciples did not get drunk. So they could still enjoy wine, be at the party, be together. They could still be holy and be relevant. And I think what's, that's what God is calling us to be. He's asking us, in one sense, to be set apart, to be part of his people. But he's also asking us to be relevant and to do it in a way which is holy. And that's a, a broad uh, invite for what God is doing in our lives. So I want to just ask the worship team uh, to come on up. And uh, as the worship team comes up, I want us to just think about one question. And that is this. How can you have fun and love others? How can you have fun and love others? Uh, or what is it that God is doing in your life? Or how can you be living for the Lord where you can really enjoy that you could say, this is a surprise to me, uh, but I am serving the Lord or I'm living my life for the Lord that really is fun, but it's also got the heart of how do I love others? How am I caring for others? How is there a sense of being like Jesus in what you're doing? So again, how can you have fun and love others? And I think once we put that together, we're getting a sense of this first miracle that Jesus is demonstrating to us. And as his disciples, as Jesus forms us, he's saying our life in him should be one where we have joy, where we have fun, but we're loving others. How can we do it? And obviously, it's going to be different for each one of us. Let's...